it didn't light me up being a lawyer. I did well at it. I had a lot of nice things and a nice place to live, but there was an emptiness inside of me and an intuitive hit that I was supposed to do something else. Too many good souls have recited their excuses so many times they've hypnotized themselves into believing they're true. You can tell a victim because they give away their power to the things they complain and blame and excuse about. How do you get your power back? You start doing the things you've been giving your excuses to. There's no point of winning according to the world's scoreboard if you lose at your own. Instinct is more powerful than intellect. Intellect said, this makes no sense whatsoever. Intellect is just the sum total of what the world teaches you is possible. We must be possibilitarians. So trust your instinct. Your instinct is your higher wisdom leading you to where life wishes you will be, even if it's crazy. I don't know if I've ever shared this, but oh wow. So I did it. I, I read your book, um, your newest book, The Wealth Money Can't Buy. It's a genius title. And, you know, as a podcast host, Robin, I, I read a lot of books. I don't, I don't usually go deep as I'm reading in the way that you would read just for yourself. Um, and so I started reading your book. And what I found was that I was actually sitting with a lot of the the chapters because they're they're very short they're very bite sized chapters and it's very personal which I which I wasn't expecting and um, I've read the Creative Act by Rick Rubin which you you alluded to in your book not by name but I I, I got that that's what you were referring to um, you also alluded to the War of Art which is one of my favorite books and Stephen Pressfield has been on this podcast a few times. And I feel like if the creative act and the war of art, <laughs> and maybe, I don't know if you ever read David Lynch's Catching the Big Fish, but he's big into meditation. And they're all books with like short little snippets, little vignettes, little anecdotes. If they had like a, a love child, it would, be, it would be your book, The Wealth Money. <laughs> That's funny. Because you feel like you feel like it's more of a journal. You're just kind of with I'm with Robin as he's eating, as he's flying around, and just kind of noticing these things as he's going into a coffee shop here, and and uh, and so I found that I found that so uh, refreshing. You don't read a lot of books like that. Yet it was full of wisdom and full of gems, and and a lot of things that I personally have experienced or have wanted to experience. Um, for instance, I just started doing cold showers every morning a few months ago, and you had a little thing on that, and um, you know, doing those little random acts of kindness where you would give someone a bottle of wine from a hotel, or if they mentioned something and you came across that thing, you would go out and get that. Um, everything from like the drama in your old relationships and how you found this sort of new love, and I feel like I know a little bit more about her, and so it was, I just want to say, first of all, congratulations on making it so relatable and so accessible. And, um, and I, I can't imagine anybody who sits with that book, not being able to relate to some of the things that you you've experienced. Thank you so much. You know, Marshall McLuhan said that is what is most personal is most universal. So what I tried to do with the wealth money camp buy is set it up as a mentoring conversation. And so I've, in some of the chapters, I invited people here into my writing room where I, where I am right now, or out on my nature walks or on my trips across this messy and most beautiful world. And I tried to share my scars, share my lessons of life. I've got a fair number of years under my belt right now. I think we're in a world of um, a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people are looking within. A lot of people have tried what society has said will bring them wealth, health, and happiness, and they wake up still feeling empty with this German word angst in them. So I tried to write from a very uh, loving place, 
or provided people a lot of wisdom and what I've learned about having a great life and what true wealth is all about. Well, I want to take it back to the early days, um, Robin, to kind of connect the dots between where you started and, and, and where you are now. So um, I know that you were born in Uganda and that your parents are, are of Indian origin, although your mom was, was from Kenya, but I know a lot of Indians migrated over to Kenya um, to work. And so anyway, you guys ended up in, in Canada, in a very small town in Canada. And in those early days, you, you've mentioned several times your dad, you know, posted that poem, that Tagore poem up on the refrigerator and you and your brother and and that you had a lot of self-help books in your house growing up and your dad's community doctor, et cetera. Talk about what the vibe was like in your, in your house, right? Did you guys have like an altar? Was there like a little puja thing? Did your dad have a little morning ritual that he would invite you and your brother to participate in? Um, what were some of the philosophies and ideologies that you learned from your dad growing up? Wow. Well, I would say what was the vibe like, you know, I, I, my dad turned 87 on Friday and my mom is in her early eighties and they're just incredible parents. Um, and I have a wonderful relationship with them. Uh, I've been on this book tour that you mentioned before we started. So I flew them to London last month and we just you know in, in the day i do podcast but every night we have dinner together it was just some of the best times we've ever had so great parents um what are some of the philosophies well my dad's father was a priest so my my dad was very big on service um, my dad was a community doctor for 54 years. When he were finally retired, I said, why? He said, because my patients need me. So he talked a lot about service. He talked a lot about a lot of the stories that he would share when we were growing up were about people who were very humble. There, I, I come from a place called Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. And there was this industrial titan, but he'd walk around with these bags, you know, cloth bags with his things in them. So lots of stories about humility. And uh, yeah, my dad talked a lot about not being wedded to material possessions and living simply. Um, my mom is a force of nature, light. She still has so much energy. She taught me a lot of philosophy. She would teach me things like what is yours is yours and can't be taken away from you. What is not meant for you is not yours, so don't worry about not having it. Uh, she taught me about bravery. A very brave woman and someone who's very comfortable in her own skin. So, yeah, that was that was the vibe. And you, you oftentimes will post your books, your top book referrals on your social media these days. Uh, what were some of the biographies that, that resonated the most when you were growing up? Well, I, I really got into personal development in my teens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was always fascinated with the Kennedys. Really? At that stage of my life? Yeah. Yeah. The the Kennedys. I just find, you know, I find the, the patriarch uh, of the Kennedy clan is a very fascinating man, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, I read biographies on Martin Luther King has been very influential in my life. I often talk about Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I read, read about him. Um, Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, my experiments with truth was very profound to me. And yeah, then over the years, I got into books like the meditation meditations by Marcus Aurelius. I was reading that in my early thirties. Um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel by Richard Bach. Have you read that book? I have. Yeah. Amazing book. It's not, mm -hmm. a, it's not a story about a seagull. 
Well, a <laughs> lot more than just a seagull. It's a seagull who wanted to fly higher. I think it's really the hero's journey, you know, a seagull who didn't fit in with the crowd, mm -hmm. knew they had talents beyond what they were experiencing, found a mentor. The mentor became the guide, taught the seagull how to fly, and kind of like the old movie The Matrix and a lot of the books based on the hero's journey, once the seagull realized how powerful it was, it went back into the tribe. So mm -hmm. that was a book, powerful book. Uh, it's not a biography, but the uh, Catcher in the Rye. Have you read that? Yeah, J.D. Salinger. Love, love, love that book. Have you read the uh, Anthem by Ayn Rand? No, I haven't read the Anthem. Wow, great summer reading. Okay, amazing, amazing, amazing book. It's a little book, but powerful. So, so give us a montage between that moment you're now in your teens and you're, you're making your way to becoming an attorney, right? Um, litigator. What, what was that journey like? And, uh, what was happening in the background while you were doing that, that sort of indicated that maybe one day you were going to start writing. I don't know if there was much in the background that predicted that I'd be writing in the future. Uh, I always love to talk. I'm a, I, you know, I'm a Gemini, so I love, we love to express. I loved words. And I guess as a litigator, you are, you are, you're speaking and you're presenting and you're making a point of view. So what's the montage? Well, I became a lawyer for maybe some wrong, some of the wrong reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're told if you become a, a lawyer, you're going to wake up happy and you're winning. And what I've learned is there's no point of winning according to the world's scoreboard if you lose at your own. So it was, it didn't light me up being a lawyer. I did well at it. I had a lot of nice things and a nice place to live. But uh, there was an emptiness inside of me and an intuitive hit that I was supposed to do something else. So, uh, so I just, I started writing. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right, thank you so much for helping out, and back to the show. So back in those days, I'm a little younger than you are, right? But I remember like the height of success was like going and working on Wall Street or, or becoming a high-powered attorney or something. Nobody was really talking about passion or doing what feels aligned or anything like that. Um, and I know as an immigrant, like coming from India, it's, there's a very heavy emphasis on, you know, STEM professions. And um, th was that impressed upon you that that's something that you should strongly consider being an attorney? And if so, uh, how did you sort of, was that, did you have to reconcile that in order to start doing other things? Did you, did you hide the writing that you were doing um, when you first started working on that on that on that first book? Well, yes and no. Yes, from my cultural background, it's basically, you know, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. You become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. So, for, from a young age. I was encouraged to do that. So that's why I say yes. You know, there was that cultural encouragement, let's say. No, I didn't have to hide what I was doing. My my mom was my first editor on The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And my father helped me sell her at service clubs and was very, very encouraging. I don't share this often, but when I, when I self-published The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, there was a, a book called The Bookseller. That was about 50 seller, C-E-L-L-A-R. You'd have to go down the steps. 
Mm-hmm. And so I, I was a self-published author and I would, I walked in and I said, would, you know, would you sell this book at your shop? And they'd only take it on consignment, which as you know, it means they won't pay for it. If you don't sell it, you've got to come back and pick it up. So they said, sure, we'll take it on consignment. They took, I don't know, five books. Lo and behold, after a week, I went back and they sold out. Another week later, they took seven books and all of a sudden it got on their top 10 bestseller list. And week after week, I would go back and they would be sold out and it would be on the bestseller list for the bookseller. So that encouraged me so much. I said, there's something, you know, something special about the monkey sold as Ferrari because look, it's a small market, but look how well it's doing. And I think it was last year or the year before I was having dinner with my father and he said, you remember that shop that your book, when you first started out, the book was a bestseller. I said, yeah. And I said, that was, I still remember that. He said, yeah, I was the one buying the books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was wondering when you were saying that, cause I, I've written a few books and it's so hard to get people to read your, your book. I'm wondering who's reading his book. Like did someone from the bookstore, but now it makes sense. Your dad was going. In. Yeah. And, and then, and book. then, so I, I said, really dad. And I, I, so I, Went down into his basement and I saw ten thousand books. I'm just joking, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, so yeah, they were encouraged. My parents were encouraging, and only a few years ago did they say we were really scared that mm. you were thinking about leaving this very secure position as a litigation lawyer to start a career as as a completely anonymous author. That's what I love about your story, though, is that, you know, we, we see it, it's now you go on social media and you can't scroll twice without somebody telling you to take a leap of faith or follow your passion or something like that. And I love how you didn't quit your job and you just I'm imagining you probably reorganize your schedule so that you could work and you could start to explore this other thing that was very you know, exciting to you. And then they also say when you create or when you write, you just you start with what you know. And you started with, well, your first book was Mega Living, which, you know, obviously was a manual for success. But then you started with the Monk Sotis Ferrari writing about an attorney. And I'm imagining, I don't know for sure, but was that like a composite character, the Julian character? Or was that something, was it based on, was it completely something that you made up? I imagine you knew people like that and that's what sort of sparked the the inspiration. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're very smart. And you're very well prepared. So I appreciate that. And I smiled when you were asking the question because it made me think, yes, I believe in hedged risk taking, mm-hmm. uh, thoughtful risk taking. So I didn't quit my position as a lawyer until HarperCollins bought the book. And we can talk about that. But I'm smiling because... What I would do, I was invited to speak in Dubai. I don't know if I've ever shared this, but I was invited to speak in Dubai when I was just in the early stages of, of writing. And this is when Dubai was not what Dubai right. currently is. It was, it was amazing, amazing how small it was. But I took, I don't know, three two vacation days off. So all my colleagues go, oh, yeah, you're taking a few days off. And I go, yeah, you know, I flew to Dubai, gave the speech, experienced a little bit of Dubai, flew back, showed up at the office like three days later. And, uh, and it made me smile because, you know, I'd been to Dubai, but they just, they, they just thought I, I took a few days off. And so, um, yeah, I, th- I think, uh, the, the hedged risk taking was was the way to go and when the time was right i decided to leave the law and pursue this full time what's also interesting about about this this part of the story is you you've talked about you know meeting that the president of harper collins but your books were in there already okay so it's like you had to put the work in to get your books in there and then i don't know if this is true or not but your son wanted to go in the bookstore that day and that's why you went in there and while you were in there, you were like, let me sign some copies of, of my book. And what, what do you, what made Ed notice you signing copies? Had he heard of this book or he just kind of saw the title and was intrigued by it? What, what the hell was he doing in the bookstore? So you're absolutely right. My son Colby, who is now 30, was, I believe, four years old at the time. 
and he used to love uh, all things carpentry. So there was a Home Depot next to this bookstore. So thanks to my son, we ended up in the Home Depot and it was a rainy night and I decided, let me go into this bookstore and sign copies of my books. And so again, there were five books on consignment. I asked the manager, do you mind if I sign the books? They didn't know who I was, but they said, sure, go ahead and sign your your little your little you know self-published, worthless monk who sold his Ferrari. And so I did that, went up to the front of the store, placed my son on the on the counter, a little kid, held on to him. With the other hand, I was signing books. It was a gentleman in a long green trench coat. I remember it very, very well. He was watching me sign the book, and then he said, Wow, the monk who sold his Ferrari, what a great title. We just started chatting and I said, you know, I'm a lawyer, but this is my calling and I love it and I want to get the book out here and I've self-published it, et cetera, et cetera. And he reached into his coat and he pulled out his wallet and pulled out a card. And I looked at the card and it said, Ed Carson, President Harper Collins. About two weeks later, they bought the world rights to the book for $7,500. You created your own luck there. And... I think that's another gem or takeaway for people is, is that we hear about being in the right place at the right time, but you do have to put in a significant amount of work in order to create that right place and that right time. And so you obviously didn't have an agent. You didn't have all the things that people think they need in order to do the thing or take the leap, but you just do what you can, which is exactly what you did. You probably didn't know what was going to happen after that, but you end up selling, you know, tens of thousands of copies and then it started to become this whole phenomenon. So what do you attribute that to in the book that you wrote, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari? Um, why was it a success when you reflect back on it today? Well, first of all, you make, you make some interesting points about the process and what I would say is some of the lessons I've learned that might be helpful to all your viewers and listeners, instinct is more powerful than intellect. Intellect said, this makes no sense whatsoever. Intellect is just the sum total of what the world teaches you is possible. We must be possibilitarians. George Bernard Shaw said, the reasonable man, to use his words, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in adapting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So trust your instinct because I know we can go here with you, Light. Your instinct is your higher wisdom leading you to where life wishes you will be, even if it's crazy. Second thing I would say is you don't get lucky, you make lucky. And this is what's happening, I think, in the world. Too many good souls have recited their excuses so many times they've hypnotized themselves into believing they're true. You can tell a victim because they give away their power to the things they complain and blame and excuse about. How do you get your power back? You start doing the things you've been giving your excuses to. So you don't get lucky, you, you make lucky. If I were to deconstruct it, I think the title really amused people. Mm -hmm. Title is a contradiction. Was that the first option that the title just come to you in the shower? That's it. The monk who sold his Ferrari or how'd you come up with that title? Well, when I was writing the book, I had, I had a ritual where I'd go for an hour morning walk before I'd start writing. And the title came to me on one of those walks. Mm. So, and, and there were a few titles, but once I got it, I accepted it and I knew it was the right title and people around me laughed at it. I had some friends who I shared the title with and they just go, that's, you know, it's not a very, not, not such an intelligent title. No one's going to read the book. And that's why another takeaway perhaps is, you know, an opinion is just an opinion. You don't give it more value than an opinion is worth. Tr trust your gut on what you feel to be right. So I think it was the title of the monk who sold his Ferrari that resonated. I think people really vibed with the story. 
you're right. Julian Mantle was a composite. I was a, I was a lawyer, but I didn't have a heart attack. So people liked the story. People, I think people liked the information and the lessons that I shared. You know, I wrote the book over 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I was talking about the 5 a.m. club in that book. I was talking about purpose, which is so powerful right now. I was talking about legacy. I was talking about a lot of the fundamental things that we all long for and deal with as, as human beings. And it's been talked about for hundreds of years. But I think the way I put it together in the story about this lawyer who had everything but had nothing, took a heart attack in a courtroom, went to the Himalayas, found these sages who had figured it all out, and went back to the world to teach what he learned, born and knew. It just it resonated with people in, in many different cultures. One more question about the monk. Um, sure. Paulo Coelho says that he wrote The Alchemist in two weeks. So in other words, he channeled it. And for this book, what was was it hard? Did you feel like you were channeling it? Was it a little bit of both? Because it's such an it's such a unique story. <laughs> Paulo, Paulo Coelho is an amazing, amazing person. And, you know, I, I, I was blessed to share a, a great dinner with him a number oh, wow. of years ago. Yeah. And, and I only mention it because to me, it was just uh, so fascinating to do that and to share a meal with him and to hear about how he does things. Uh, and how much he loves what he does. And I've, I've read that as well, that he did it in two weeks. Uh, you know, he must know something I sure don't know because <laughs> my the, the, the Wealth Money Camp buy took me 12 months last year of beautiful right. suffering. <laughs> I mean, 5 a.m. club I, took you four years. Four years, four <laughs> years, 5 a.m. Everyday Hero Manifesto in the pandemic, two years of just t taking myself to the jagged edges of my my potential and writing and it was a very interesting way like my books the way it works is no it's not two weeks light it's i'll write a manuscript and i'll go wow got it amazing one month done and then i'll hand it into my editor or i'll come back to it a month later and just go I can't believe I wrote this. I've got to rewrite the whole thing. Then I'll rewrite it and I'll, you know, be like feeling them in flow and wow, it's great. It's in great shape now. Whoa. And then I'll come back to it another three weeks later or, or six weeks later. And I'll just go, no, I've got, how could I have written this? I, and, I, and I just, and this is where I do believe in the muse, you know, I just rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. And then after, you know, with the monk, it was about a year. And then I just go, it's done. I don't want to look at it again. I, I get to a place where I don't want to look at it again. And I actually feel, because you're getting us into some creativity, and I don't talk about this a lot, but I love it. I actually feel that if I rewrite anything else, I'm going to make the work worse versus better. And when I'm there, I know I'm done. Mm. Yeah, as I mentioned, I've, I've written four books. And the way I know I'm done is I never go back and read any of my books. Once I turn them into the publisher and it gets out, I mean, it's not that I never, I obviously will peruse them and when I'm doing interviews and stuff like that, but I just know that when I'm done, I'm ready to move on to, to the next thing. And that's one of my personal ways of, of understanding that I'm done, but you, you know, you're doing something right, man, because your books are more often than not international bestsellers. You've now written dozens of, of bestsellers. And then recently you have, you sold everything off and you, you moved from Canada to Italy. And this is also something that I'm really interested about in your story, because I had my own nomadic journey in 2018. I sold everything off. I was 45 years old at the time and uh, living in Santa Monica, California, I had two bedroom place, two cars, a Vespa. And I'm curious, what was the hardest thing for you to give away? when you got rid of everything? Well, first of all, you look like you're 20, so you're doing something <laughs> right. <laughs> I know you're um, a 
a much respect. I know you do a lot of things very well, but I know you're a much respected uh, mindfulness or meditation teacher. But uh, whatever you're doing, it's it's working. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I I sold my house, mm -hmm. and um, that was our family home, and uh, I said to my partner Al. You know, just when I got the place exactly the way I I want us to have it, or we we want to have it, uh, I sold it, and she very wisely said, "Of course, that's the time to sell it." Mm -hmm. But I'd lived I'd lived in the the city where I was living for thirty years, and I'm nomadic like you, and I think thirty years is more than enough time to stay in in one place. About uh, 13 years ago, I started coming to Rome every six weeks, every two months. I would leave my usual place and go to Rome to write for a week. I just find the energy of Rome. Anyone who loves magic and beauty, Rome is the place. Or certainly it is for me. I think we all have different places where we go to them and we feel alive and we mm -hmm. feel free. And Rome is a place where when I walk the streets, it just, I feel very alive and very free. So I fell in, my best friend Luigi lives in Rome. He taught me a lot about Italian culture. I fell in love with Cacio, Cacio Pepe, the Roman pasta and the Roman food, Roman art, Villa Borghese, the beautiful park there. And so seeds were planted where I said, you know, I could, I should, I want to live there. And about three years ago, as you're suggesting, I, I sold a lot of my things and I packed up what I needed into a few suitcases. I talked about this at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. Elle and I got on an airplane with our little dog, Holly, at Chorky. And of course, we landed in Rome, waited for the baggage to come off the, Better it came. <laughs> the, the conveyor belt. <laughs> like, okay, these, these are the few things that we need to survive. Yeah. And of course, and I don't, I can't remember ever losing my luggage and, you know, it didn't come off the plane. So we just laughed. It was, it was another lesson in letting go. One of the great lessons of life, letting, letting go it in the book before this one, the everyday hero manifesto. One of the chapters was that time I lost my journals, 10 years of my journals. Let's say, let's say just vanished. And that was a great lesson in letting go, like my journals, my personal journals, you know, my, my, my hopes, my dreams, my longings, my fears, my processing through pain, my recording of victories, 10 years, all gone. What does that teach you? It takes you, teaches you to learn the fine and beautiful human art of letting go. And so getting off an airplane and not seeing the bags, what are you going to, you just laugh. You just you just laugh and we just go well fine and and the next day the the luggage showed up at the hotel but yes uh let go off a lot to get here yeah as i mentioned earlier your book it feels like a journal so that's not surprising to hear that you are, are you you're an avid journaler you journal every day or how does how does your what's your journaling routine like almost every day almost every day i've got i mean you just you, you create a you create a vibe of, on your podcast. It's like uh, unlike any other podcast I've been on. It's just like we're, you know, it's amazing. But this is a few wow. of the journals over the the past the past months right here. Mm -hmm. And yes, I I absolutely adore journaling. It's part of my morning routine with two cups of espresso and good country music. I journal for about at least half an hour every day. What does it look like? Uh, I ask myself five questions. I call the the practice, the five question morning maximizer. Number one, I'll write, what am I grateful for? We all know that gratitude is the antidote to fear. Mm -hmm. So I'll write about things I'm grateful for. And I try to, Sonia Lubomirsky, the eminent pos social positive psychologist, has found in her research that the happiest people practice deliberate gratitude. So I will deliberately look for things that I might take for granted. Second question is, where am I winning? The human brain, as you know very well, light has a feature called the negativity bias. It served us well hundreds of thousands of thousands of years ago when we faced many threats like 
warring tribes and predators, and we could die of starvation if we left the herd. But now we have this negativity bias, and that's why in our lives we focus on our curses versus our blessings. So answering that question, where am I winning, causes me to focus on micro wins, which protects my hope, gives me energy, and gives me momentum. Third question, the big one, what will I let go of today? So that helps me do some processing, some emotional processing. You might know in my work, people talk about mindset, very important. I also talk about heart set. So that emotional processing is letting go of people you need to forgive, or I might let go of a resentment I might be carrying. Just a paragraph. I might write, let go of a disappointment. Uh, fourth question is, what does my ideal day ahead look like? Writing a paragraph of your ideal day ahead gives you, works like magic, it gives you not only focus, but the connection with real commitment and the clarity to get your ideal day done. And your days are your life in miniature. So as you live each day, so you craft the life. And then the fifth question, what? What must be said at the end? Hmm. So that's memento mori, Latin for remember you will die. So one paragraph on what I once said about me after I die. Hmm. And that connects me to my personal Mount Everest, which gives me focus and helps me live to the point each day versus busy being busy. So that's sort of a bit of my journaling practice. If I'm traveling, I'll take the hotel paper with the logo, stick it in with my little glue stick. I travel with a, a baggie and my little glue stick. If I'm on an airplane, I'll take the boarding pass, glue it in the journal, write about what I'm learning, what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing. I love journaling. It's amazing. Wow. I love that. Thank you so much for, for going into such detail on that process. That's a part of the 20, 20, 20. That's the second phase, the 20, the second 20, right? The journaling. So yeah, you've been on these things for a long time and you've been writing about these things for a long time. And so when it comes to the wealth that money can't buy, it, it makes sense that you now have created a, a basically a, a, a white pages for us to be able to kind of get a snapshot of, of most of the concepts and the principles that you have been teaching and speaking about and writing about for nearly three decades but also in a journal form. So it's kind of like everything is, I don't know, it feels like everything's just sort of come together um, from everything that you've been doing. And you, you say it's the eight hidden habits to live your richest life, which immediately reminds me of the eight limbs of yoga and how, you know, Hatha yoga, which is the one we normally associate with yoga, Chaturanga, Up Dog, Warrior One, that kind of thing, is only one of the limbs. Of yoga and just like when we hear the word wealth in western culture we immediately think about money investments assets etc and you're saying that this is only really just one form of of wealth and this may seem like a, a i don't know a curious question but why why eight how'd you come up with eight as opposed to seven i think conventional wisdom in marketing says you should do an odd number instead of an even number and, um, and I'm curious why, why eight? Well, because I, when I write and create things, I don't think about marketing. I think about <laughs> what, what feels, what feels most true to me and, and most helpful to my readers. And, um, and the paradox is if you work with love and the spirit of service, people feel the love and spirit of service in everything that you create. I think it's the most profound thing. People, people can sniff your devotion to your craft. It's so much more powerful than any marketing logo. So why eight? Well, about 15 years ago, I started mentoring billionaire sports superstars, movement makers, etc. And a lot of these people were cash rich. They were life poor. They had everything that the world says should make you happy. And they were, many of them were extraordinarily empty. They were disconnected to their family members. Some of them had kids who wouldn't even talk to them. Some of them would drink too much to medicate themselves. Some of them have, had lost their health as they built their businesses towards a liquidity event where they made their fortunes. So I created this model 
the eight forms of wealth that is the, the foundation of the wealth money can't buy and just to serve my clients. And then maybe two years ago or whatever it was, I decided to write this book around that model. And it was just, I found that wealth comes in eight forms. And yes, you're right. Money is one of the forms of wealth and no one's going to say, or I wouldn't say it's unimportant. Of course, it's important. Money puts food on your table. Money allows us to handle our responsibility. Money allows us not to be, having enough money allows us not to be backed into a corner to make choices we don't like. Money allows us to help people in need. But it's one of the, it's only one of the eight forms of wealth, like the first form of wealth. And with you, we can go into it personally. The first form of wealth is what I call growth. But you know, our society doesn't say, wow, you're meditating and you're journaling and you're working with healers. And you're doing sweat lodges to release the people you haven't forgiven. And you're taking nature walks and you're visualizing and you're praying and et cetera, et cetera. You're rich. But what could be richer than building intimacy with your primal genius and who you're meant to be? A uh, third form of wealth, family. I mean, to have a deep connection with the people you love and who love you, it's, it's priceless. So there are eight forms of wealth. Money's only one of them. And as we live all eight, we find true wealth in our life and live our richest days. I want to just uh, mention some of the concepts that, that resonated with me the most from, from the book. Um, OMAD, one, one meal a day, the power of fasting. Fascinating concept. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I'm not giving medical advice and my main focus isn't health, but it is the second form of wealth. And just to go macro for a moment, health is something we take for granted until we lose it. There's one wisdom tradition that says when we are young, we would sacrifice our health for wealth. When we get old, we would sacrifice all of our wealth for one day of good health. So OMAD is one meal a day. You're right. There's a term that I find very powerful or concept that's very powerful called autophagy. It's all about caloric restriction. So intermittent fasting and eating less food puts you into a state of autophagy, which promotes cellular clearing. I also, you know, this, a lot of the great pundits, a lot of the great spiritual masters, they fasted. And from what I've read, these people, through their fasting, entered altered states, almost a secret universe of perception and advanced understanding. And so the more I realized, now, as you know so well, science is catching up with what the mystics have been saying for hundreds of years. That's so exciting. But when you fast, you not only go into autophagy, which cleans the cells and extends longevity, but you release BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And it seems to me that the release of BDNF, which promotes advanced perception in the brain, is one of the reasons fasting allows people to enter these states. Um, oh man, one meal a day. My mom did it once a week for as long as I can remember, but I think it's just a great thing to do once a week or whatever feels right to you and what your doctor recommends. But, um, and then what I also said in that chapter is take the food you don't eat that day, having just one meal and give it to someone in need. And that way you get the benefits and you give someone else a gift. You also um, recommend intentionally eating alone, which I, I, that's something I do. I've done that for years. I mean, I can relate to a lot of, uh, a lot of aspects of, of, of how you live, but I think that's something that's very intimidating for a lot of people eating alone and um, particularly women. So what's the, what's, what's the value when it comes to the money that we can't buy of eating alone? Well, the value is that chapter is in the growth section and as we grow more into our power and become braver versus insecure, it's a, it's a form of wealth. Mm. And why should we do it? 
because it's intimidating as to use your words. That's why we should do it. <laughs> the things that intimidate us are the very things we need to do as soon as possible. I think the fears we don't face become our walls. And as we go to the edges of our fears, we expand our limits. So most of us are scared to be alone in a restaurant full of people. I read about it in the chapter, you know, people enjoying themselves, laughing, connecting, and we walk into a restaurant alone. What's the first thing we do, most of us in this world right now? If we do it, we pull out our, if we even go to a restaurant alone, we're on the phone the whole time. Yeah. We're on the phone the whole time. And what I'm suggesting in that chapter is turn off, don't bring your phone. Hmm. And I used to love bringing journals into a restaurant and writing in my journal. I just used to love doing that. But now I don't do that. I'll just go into the, 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 the restaurant and sit there alone and eat my food and just be fully present to the blessing of the food in front of me and to enjoy everyone around me. And this is when I'm traveling and, uh, and just enjoy the moment. And it's also training. I mean, how do you become brave? You do brave things when you don't feel like it. I call the concept micro bravery, little acts of bravery when done consistently over time, make you a far more pow powerful person. You don't have to leave your city and move to Bali or Vietnam or Medellin. You can just notice the things that you're frightened to do in the smallest of ways and practice small acts of bravery each day. And if you do five, three acts a day, I mean, the larger point is we master what we practice. As simple as that sounds, we master what we practice. Look at your life right now, where you are weak. You haven't devoted much time to that. So if you practice being brave each day through micro bravery, over time, you become a grand master of bravery. Yeah. And, you know, there's a conversation now happening in the States around putting um, warning labels on social media and things like that. And I think that it's something that we think we have control over, but we don't realize how, just how addictive it is. And depending on how we've curated our own echo chambers, how destructive it can be to our mood, right? You can be in a perfectly good mood, sit down, have a wonderful meal, but then you turn on that phone and get on social media and, and you can leave that experience in a very altered state, which may not be so great. And I've, I've been victim to that many times and it takes a lot of, of awareness and a lot of intention. In fact, this past Saturday, I was, I noticed that I was on my phone more often than I normally would be. And I had to intentionally keep myself off of it on, on that next Sunday. And it took a, you know, I was like wanting to open up the weather app and all kinds of stuff to try to stop from going into social media. So I, I it was a great reminder to, uh, to restore presence. And in order to do that, we have to be really, really intentional about, like you said, not bringing that phone in. And if you do have the phone, not going onto those, those apps. I think, I think. This is a, to state the obvious, this is a huge challenge for so many people, for all of us. As you know, a lot of the social media platforms have been designed to hook us and the scrolling, the scrolling feature from what I've read was created based on the behavior of gamblers at slot mm -hmm. machines. Mm -hmm. And so, but there are some ways around it. There's one technique called the two phone protocol that I teach. And so you have, you, I don't have my second phone right here, but I have two phones. And so one phone is your fully loaded phone. It has your weather apps and it has your social media and it has your food apps, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get a second phone and it's your, your Spartan phone. It could be an old school phone with just SMS on it. You know, and, and only your family has that number, for example. And that's the phone you carry with you through a lot of your day. You're a creative person. We can do that as creative people. And with your family, I would encourage you to have people to have family meals device free. Second protocol that could be helpful is a ZDD or ZDD, zero device day. So powerful. 24 hours with no phone, just living life. 
So turn, and the key is, I, I suggest turn it off and put it in a drawer because if you see it, you're going to check it. Mm -hmm. 24 hours, I, I love to do it on Fridays where you're just, you're reading, you're having a meal with your significant other, you're walking in the woods, you go to an art gallery, you mountain bike, but living life, it renews you in a very profound way. You you also post pretty transparently and and vulnerably and often and um, I'm curious. Do you have like your own sort of rules for how you can how you create content? Um, are you in, are you intentional about doing that? Is it kind of a whim? Like oh, I let me know this just happened. Let me post it or what, what's 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 the infrastructure behind how you you employ social media? It's it's more intuitive. Mm -hmm. So this morning I was inspired and I made my own post. I just went into the notes <laughs> app. You could probably, you can, of course, you can see that I made it myself. It doesn't look very pretty, but I just felt like I was in a creative mood. And, and I always ask myself, how can I bring value to as many people as possible? So I just shared some thoughts from that. Some, I created the post in the notes app. And then just posted in in my stories. I believe in my main my main feed as well. So some of what I do, I'm just creating it when I'm inspired. Other times we will do my team and I we will do an actual shoot of social media videos that are more produced. People seem to love those as well. When I'm traveling, I post a lot. So it's it's a mix of a number of different things based on how creative I feel and trying to bring inspiration, content, and wisdom to people. I feel like when you have a massive social media platform, maybe there's a little more intention that goes into it versus, you know, not having a big platform. And then it's, it's a question of, does that feed the readership or does the readership feed the platform is a little bit of both. Do you feel a little more pressure to not post certain things versus posting certain things because you have so many eyeballs on whatever it is that you are posting. Do you feel obligated to engage with, you know, people who, who want to engage with you in various ways? Do you have sort of any rules around that? Well, for instance, I have a rule where I don't, I don't engage with trolls or anything like that. Like anything like that just gets completely ignored because I just rather, rather spend my attention focusing on creation and on, you know, putting positivity out there. Well, I don't, I don't feed the trolls <laughs> and I don't listen to the opinion of people who aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone has an opinion. Yeah. And I think if you do great work, it is going to anger some and enchant others. J.K. Rowling said, for some to love you, some must love you. So if you've done your work right, not everyone is going to love it. Secondly, I'm sh you seem like a very sensitive person, light. <laughs> people people can be, critics can be very, very mean. And you go, what are you, like, did you really read my book? And so... That makes me think of Bob Dylan. Don't criticize what you don't understand. So that's an upper rule. Yeah. Third rule is as much as possible. How do you build a movement? One reader or one follower at a time. So one of my clients is a very big retail organization and the head of the organization, multi-billionaire. And I was speaking at the conference and he spoke before me and he said, what I do every Sunday night is I look at the negative feedback and I call these customers in little towns and I listen to them and ask them why they didn't like what we serve, what we offer. And someone said in the audience said, why would you do that? You're a multi-billionaire, top CEO, et cetera. And he said, because this is personal for me. And so in my prayers, my, what I call MVP, meditation, visualization, and prayer, part of my prayer is I pray for the success of my clients and my readers. And what I'm trying to say is one of my social media things is as much as possible, I go into my DMs every day and I look at people who are, you know, maybe at 
teenager in Mumbai or whoever it might be, and I use the audio feature and I record messages of gratitude and encouragement to the people who, who read my books 31 years into the game. And, and that to me is um, when you ask about a, a rule, just keeping the intimacy with all the people who trust you and have faith in your work by replying to DMs is very powerful. Even in the comments, I do my best to personally to reply to as many of the comments as possible. Yeah, those would be, those would be, I don't follow, I don't follow people who, who are toxic. I call this the IPOP principle, input positivity, output positivity. I think we have to, as creatives and, you know, as creatives uh, and producers, I think it's really important to protect your energy and your positivity and your inspiration. And I try to only put in as much positivity as possible because that determines the content I put out. I love it. And you mentioned MVP, meditation, visualization, prayer. You've talked about this a lot. You've written about it a lot. The question I have, uh, Robin, is how do you recommend praying? I think people get visualization and meditation, but what, you know, obviously people come from different religious backgrounds, et cetera. What's a good sort of secular way to, to get the praying part in and to make that effective? Sure. Well, I'll, if I may, I'd love to quickly just go through MVP because there's so, as you know, better than most, there's so many different forms of meditation. Sure. So, you know, I've written this book, the 5 a.m. club. Yet 4 a.m. is the new 5 a.m. And I love the past year I've been getting up at 4 a.m. and it's just magnificent. That means I'm now in bed at 9.30 versus 11 p.m. But it just works so well. I, I know it might sound strange. Every new idea sounds radical and crazy until it's normalized. So I get up at 4 o'clock and I do 45 minutes of MVP. What is my MVP is most valuable player in sports for me. It's meditation, visualization, and prayer. What does the meditation look like? Often it's 20 minutes of breath work where I will body scan my body. I know you know what I'm talking about. And I will locate if there's some t tension, let's say in my solar plexus. For me, that means there might be some fear. So I'll just breathe into it and I will accept it and I will befriend it and I will work through to release it. Sometimes when I meditate, I'm, I'm laying in bed. I'll breathe in strength, exhale insecurity. I'll breathe in peace, exhale fear. I'll just work on kind of mantra while I'm breathing in the strength or the trait that I want and I'll release the weakness. Then I get to visualization. Every quarter I have what I call my four beautiful projects. And so I visualize myself inhabiting those four projects as if they were completely done in the way that I want them to. So I, I really just live the felt experience of my four beautiful projects as if they were real. And then we get to prayer. If you're not religious, then do scientific prayer because the research confirms, you know, science confirms praying works. And so and if you're religious, then it could be religious prayer. What does it look like? Great question. I pray for my elderly parents, for their peace, for their long life, for their happiness. I pray for the my partner, Al. I pray for my children and the rest of our family. I pray for my dog, who I called in the Wealth Money Can't Buy, Super Chum, because that's what she is. I then pray for my team because my team is like my family to me. I then pray for my clients. I pray for each of my readers who reads my books. I then pray for the attributes and powers that I aim to have. And then I pray for the world. I pray for peace in the world. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Beautiful. You mentioned L, your partner, and there's a part in your book where you talk about 
what makes great marriages, um, separate bedrooms and 10,000 dinners. And having been married before and now in this other partnership, and you kind of, you, you got kind of vulnerable there where you talked about you've been through some dramatic times, you know, in between, and now you feel like you have an aligned partnership. I would love to um, hear more about, about that, about relationships, how you're thinking about relationships um, these days when it comes to uh, sustainability or growth. Like, you know, Eckhart talks about how he says, don't worry about what who, the characteristics of just getting a relationship because you can't really grow unless you're in a relationship, implying that some of that tension or friction or drama is actually growth inducing. Um, and I'm just curious what how, how your perspective juxtaposes with that. Well, I, I have a, a very different take, and I say that with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. I think if you're in a toxic, I think there's much better ways to grow, grow. and heal, <laughs> to, to grow, heal, evolve, than be in a toxic relationship that destroys your soul every day. <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather be alone walking in the woods or riding my mountain bike or reading or or in our galleries versus being in any relationship that's designed to activate my, what I call my ancient wounds so I can heal. So what are, and just to be clear, the chapter you're referring to about separate bedrooms, et cetera, that doesn't come from me. It comes from, the chapter is called Ask the 10,000 Dinners Question. It comes from one of the UK's top divorce lawyers, Ayesha Vardag. And she was interviewed and she, she was asked, you know, you've seen so many different difficult relationships. What is your wisdom on what makes a great relationship? And she said, number one, separate bedrooms. And number two, she said, 10,000 dinners. The journalist said, what do you mean by 10,000 dinners? And she said, you know, looks fade, lust dissolves. But if you see yourself having 10,000 dinners with that person, keep them close because great love is hard to find. So let's deconstruct. Or you want me to deconstruct some of the things? Well, I just want to tell it like it is based on my experience. And this is just my humble offering. But this idea of universes colliding hasn't worked for me. <laughs> you know, the, this idea of universes collide and opposites hasn't worked for me. What's worked for me is finding someone who sees the world in a similar way to the way I see the world. Someone who has similar values, light. Someone who loves to do things I love to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of energy is spent in negotiating. Oh, you like this, so I'll go do this. And I like this, so you do that. For me, it's why do that? Why not just take the time and find someone who loves the things you love to do. Ellen and I, each evening, I live in this old farmhouse. And when I'm at home, not on the road, we love sitting down with our dog, sitting on my lap, catching up on the day. Last night, we watched the John Galliano documentary on Apple, which is amazing. And we will chat and we will laugh. Sometimes we'll read. Sometimes I will work on my Italian but we just love many of the same things. We don't need to be in a restaurant every night. We love being at home. We love simple food. We love walks. She's a yoga teacher. Uh, she gets me. That's another factor. Rather than, you know, in, in the book before this one, The Everyday Hero Manifesto, one of the chapters was a red flag is a red flag. That's another humble offering. A red, I did this post on Instagram, a red flag is a red flag. And I saw a few people, just a couple of people, they wrote, no, don't look at someone's red flag. Look within and see what, what you're attracting. Or, and my, my thought was, no, like a red flag is a red flag. If someone lies at the beginning, they're going to lie later. If they, if someone is doesn't keep their promises, 
that's a red flag. If someone, et cetera, et cetera, I think we run into a lot of problems where we see red flags, but we don't want to see the red flags and we pray that they're green and you could lose 20 years of your life because of that mistake. When you met Elle, I'm curious how you met her, if you're willing to share that, but what were some of the things, some of the green flags that you noticed you thought, hmm, this is something that actually at this stage of my life would really work well for me? Happy to share it. Green flags. Incredibly honest. Mm -hmm. Incredibly sincere. Deeply hardworking. Huge love of family. Loves yoga. Loves personal development. Old soul. Super positive. Never speaks ill of other people. Mm. Um, takes good care of her health. I could just go on and on. S sincere. When there's a conflict, we don't have a lot of conflict, but willing to sit down and work through it in a mature way. Those are some of the green flags. Just a few. All, how did you all meet? Well, it's just it's just the two of two of us, not all of us. No, I'm just joking. Um, it's uh, we were introduced through friends. Nice. The old school dating app <laughs> introduced. Old, through old, old school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. 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 Awesome, man. Well, you know. As someone who's done a lot of, of inner work as well and being older, you know, my, my partner's in her mid thirties, I'm in my early fifties and I can relate to a lot of the qualities that, that are important to you. At the same time, I also recognize that, you know, I've, I'm further ahead and in, in the road of, of being self-aware and, you know, all those, all the things. Um, that lead to sustainable partnership. And that's been something that I've been, you know, in my past relationships sort of negotiating on and trying to, you know, learn how to become a lot firmer around and just thinking, you know, she's doing the best she can given her current understanding of how things are and maybe she'll improve. But there's like a thin line between that and falling in love with someone's potential. And um, while, while sacrificing you know, what it is, your, your values. I think some people probably struggle with that. I know I've struggled with that in the past and it's refreshing to hear your experiences. And I know it's not perfect or anything like that, but, you know, I think, um, and one of the things you talk about in your book is being very clear about your values and, and using that as sort of a guidepost for who, who you led into your life in that romantic way. Yeah. I, I hear you. I agree with you very much. I would say use joy as a GPS, trust your mm -hmm. gut, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, if you, if you just love as simple as it sounds, you don't want a project, you want a partner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, as you know, subconsciously, we are attracted to people that, you know, there's, there's drama addictions, right? And, and it's quite remarkable that and I'm just saying generally, there are some relationships that I've observed where they could be very peaceful, but one or both of, probably both of the partners have a hidden, invisible addiction to drama. So every time there's peace, they create drama. And that often goes back to childhood where there was a lot of trauma in the home. So as counterintuitive as it sounds, drama is normal. So when there's peace, it's unfamiliar, which frightens the partner. So unconsciously they create drama to recreate the familiarity of their childhood. And so I think having a partner versus creating a project is, is important for our creativity, productivity, longevity, peace of mind. 
I love that. All right, I'm going to switch topics for a bit and go to the money chapter. You mentioned something that I just, I love that I've never even thought of before, but it makes a lot of sense, which is bless your money before you spend it. Such a fascinating concept. Well, I think ener money is a, is an energy. It's a currency. And it just like if you're at the cashier at a grocery store, bless the, just, again, we master what we practice. Imagine you're at the grocery store and here's someone pushing your avocados down the conveyor belt and silently while they're doing their work, you're blessing them for the, for the helpfulness they're offering to you. And you reverse engineer the gratitude. So you then bless the people who run the store and who stock the shelves. And then you go back even more and you bless the truck drivers who carry the food from the farm. And then you bless the people who are on the farm. Maybe even bless mother earth for providing the offering to you. But if you start doing things like that, then your whole life becomes a long exercise in gratitude. And that's why I love namaste, you know, right. namaste, like I honor the divine within you, because when you think about it, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing of every person we meet. Imagine if metaphorically or physically we did namaste to every person that intersects our days. And if we even went even farther and said, you know, what if I never meet this person ever again? Like I was on a nature walk and this might sound strange, but someone drove by in a car and I went, I'm never going to see that person again in my life, probably. And I was in South Africa and there was a gentleman who every time he'd see someone, he would come alive. And I went, wow. When you see someone, you, you get so happy. And he goes, well, I've seen a lot of dead people in my life. So when I see a live person, I get really happy. Love that. It also, I think it helps you cultivate more presence and for those of us who are doing that work, you start to realize presence is the most valuable asset that you can have because this life goes by so quickly. And if you're not really present to it, then um, you're not missing so much of it that you would have otherwise. That's why those little, those little stories of like your daughter giving you that elephant and you keep it in your, like those things are so touching to me because as someone, there it is. <laughs> As someone who's given away a lot of their possessions, you know, the thing, the few things that you do have are, are so meaningful to you. And I've got this watch right here. It's not a fancy watch. I used to have Rolexes and stuff, but this one is, is, is a smart watch. It's a Garmin and, um, I use it to track my steps with, cause that's really important to me is movement and just kind of understanding how much I'm moving on a daily basis. And I, I do love the look of it, but. I dropped it a, about a year ago in, when I was in Los Angeles, just not really fully paying attention and it, the screen cracked and it's, it's been a nightmare trying to get it repaired. And, and, um, I'm always, I was going online looking for trying to find the exact one. I couldn't find it, especially here in Mexico where I live and my partner for my birthday this past year, you know, she found some watch person here in Mexico to fix it. And, and I've been trying to do that myself, but wasn't, wasn't able to do it. And, and it was like the best birthday gift I've ever had is because it took that intention. It took that thoughtfulness. It took her trying to figure out how to say, I need to fix this Garmin watch in Spanish, <laughs> you know, and this those little things when you're, when you're present to it, it's those little things that make the biggest difference. And I think that's really the essence of, of your book. You told the story of your mom, I think it was your mom who who went and confronted the biker gang in in Canada, which is an oxymoron. <laughs> the biker gang in Canada, <laughs> the nicest biker gang. No, but you presented him as potentially dangerous. But she goes out and 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 confronts them and ends up, you know, to to tell them to slow down so they don't they don't uh, cause any accidents with your daughter. And um, it turns out they met her niceness with their niceness. And that was a very touching story as well. And she baked cookies for them. But, you know, those little stories, I think we just need more of that in the world. It's so beautiful. I hear you. I agree. Those perfect moments. Sonia Lubomirsky, the preeminent 
positive psychology psychologist that I, I mentioned, she also talks about one of the habits of the happiest people and she calls it savoring. Mm -hmm. And I think making the time each day to savor, uh, one of this, one of the chapters in the wealth money camp by has become a perfect moment creator, which speaks to what you're saying. And this is the story of Eugene O'Kelly. He was the global CEO of KPNG went into his doctor's office. The doctor came back with his medical results and had an expression you never want to see on the face of your doctor when you get the results. He was given 90 days left to live, a brain tumor inoperable. And what he decided to do was confronted with his mortality. He said, I'm going to become a perfect moment creator because he realized in all his years as a business titan, he'd never taken his wife to lunch. He'd missed mm -hmm. Christmas concerts of his daughter. He hadn't taken long walks with his great friends in Central Park. So he said, I'm going to become a perfect moment creator in the last 90 days of my life, not only for my family and my loved, other loved ones, but for myself. And to me, that inspired me, that very wise story of looking for perfect moments. You know, we live in a very messy world right now. You know, it's so well light and there's a lot of confusion. There's a cost of living crisis. There's social polarization, there's pandemics, there's wars, and just inflation. And yet there are there are forms of wealth that money can't buy that are so very priceless. You know, it, it could be a family meal with your elderly parents. It could be you go for a nature walk and rather than thinking about work or whatever, you just take the time to look at the magnificence. I, I know it sounds trite, but you, you take the time to look at the beauty of nature. Uh, makes me think of a Persian proverb. I curse the fact I had no shoes until I saw the man who had no feet. So, yes, being present and looking for the blessings in our lives makes a huge difference for us. Absolutely. Mm. So my favorite part of the book, because um, I do this too, my partner gets on me for salting and peppering food <laughs> before I taste it. And you've got this wonderful little anecdote where your friend, you do that in front of your friend, put pepper on something. And he says, you know what? Henry Ford would not employ you. Would you mind sharing that, that anecdote? Sure. So I was having lunch with a friend and I think, it, I think I over salt. I think I was putting salt on or pepper and you're, you're right. And, and he said, yeah, Henry Ford would never, you'd be, would never employ you. And I said, why not? And Henry Ford used to take his potential hires to lunch and he'd notice the way they, he'd treat servers because that would say a lot about the person. And if they over salted or over peppered the food, Henry Ford believed that that showed a mindset where they would make decisions based on habit versus even checking out the quality of the food, which made, which made them unemployable in his eyes. So I guess I'm completely unemployable. <laughs> but hence, that's probably one of the reasons why you're so successful in creating content and writing and, and doing all the things you do. So let's summarize those eight um, habits for, for people who haven't read the book yet. We have growth, we have wellness, we have craft, we have family, we have money, um, we have community, we have adventure, and we have service. Did I get all of them? Correct. Perfect. Yeah. And the book has been out for about a month now. It's already become a New York Times bestseller. Congratulations. How many, how many do you have? How many of you have you written now on New York Times bestsellers? Uh, this was actually my, my first one. Really? Oh, most, okay. of, most of my books have been these quiet word of mouth phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, yeah, this was the the first time, so it was interesting. So, 
do you have, do you know how how it happened? Because you've sold you know millions of copies. Why did this one become a New York Times bestseller? And how did that make you feel? Not that you're attaching your your you know value to that, but still, you must have felt something from the first time. So why did it happen? A lot of my books they've sold well in America, yet they've really sold in Latin America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, et cetera. And for whatever reason, the wealth money can't buy has it, it has really resonated in in the US. So I think that's uh, one of the reasons. And then how did it make me feel? It, I worked so hard on the book, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I, I have to be honest with you. It made me feel, it made me feel, feel great. And then I caught myself and that's not what, as you're suggesting very wisely, that's not what it's about. I think it's very dangerous to put too much focus on bestseller lists and et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, it's about, for me, it's about service and it's about the craft. And I believe nothing fails like success. And when you start getting successful, you're in a very vulnerable, dangerous position because you can start looking at bestseller lists and, you know, celebrities reading your books and you can get really distracted. Mm. Final question. Is there, is there a, a reaction or an outcome from this book that has surprised you or something that people have focused on that you didn't really anticipate? Kind of like how Malcolm Gladwell said from his book, The Outliers, that the whole 10,000 hours principle was not something that he ever thought would go viral, right? And that was something he was using that to make another greater point. And somebody pulled that out and, um, and, 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 that's what most people recall from that book. And maybe it's still early days for, for this book to. Understand. I think a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people are deeply resonating with the through line of the book, which is our society tells us that having a lot of money and a big stock portfolio and a big house and lots of nice things as well but there are seven other forms of wealth. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of money, but they're cash rich and they're life poor. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really seems to be resonating with a lot of people in this world where it, and then in, in terms of chapters, the 10,000 dinners question, a lot of people are really, that's resonating. Uh, there's a chapter called go ghost for a year. Mm -hmm. That's really resonating with a lot of people. Uh, the, the, the final chap, the final form of wealth service, this idea, have a living funeral, um, connecting to mortality. I think that's always resonated with us as human beings. You know, the, sh the shortness of life, memento mori, remember we'll die. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's really speaking deeply to people. Like don't postpone building intimacy with your finest self and living in a way that makes you feel alive. Love it. Well, one of the things I love about the book is that you don't have to read it cover to cover necessarily. You can crack it open anywhere. Each chapter is maybe a page or two long, and you can come away with a nice little nugget of wisdom um, from your personal life. So that's my favorite format these days. It's the way I write my books. And it was such a honor to see that get it reflected at the highest, <laughs> at the highest level in your book. So thank you so, so, so much for your generosity and coming on. I know it's late where you are and uh, you probably got to get to bed in the next 30 minutes so you can wake up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so hopefully you've had your supper already. <laughs> and, uh, and no, I really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to sharing your message, not just now, but also hopefully again in the future. I'm sure you have another few books in the pipeline. Um, and because once you start writing as many books as you've written, you start seeing the world in books. That's been my experience. And you just want to help spread as many of these messages as possible. And it's, and we're really all just, you know, talking about the same message just from all these different angles. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Robin, for, for coming on to the podcast.
Thank you very much for 90 minutes of your life and uh, light and all the people that you're helping. And I just want to quickly acknowledge you for your level of preparation, which is amazing. And just your peaceful spirit. I can tell how much, I can sense how much inner work you've done and, you know, I wish you the best and um, thank you. Thank you. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.